Welcome to podcast number 36 from danjohnuniversity.com. Welcome and hello again. Uh, real quick, I got a new uh, video up online. I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, so, so far we've provided, this will be our third massive video. Uh, these are lectures I do. The first one was bounce and that was very popular. Uh, bounce is the word I use about resilience, uh, getting back in the game, and uh, dealing with life's ups and downs. Um, the second one was on the resources. That's a question I get all the time, folks. Uh, what book should I read? Uh, you know, how do I find these things out? So I'm very happy I put that in one place. And obviously, uh, I'll add to that through the years, but it's the foundational resources from my career. Well, the one we put up today is called Don't Be Binary. Boy, I tell you, this is an issue um, I, uh, I deal with. Uh, I wouldn't say constantly, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but it happens a lot. It's either or questions. Um, uh, you'll go out to a restaurant and if you're a fitness uh, trainer, you know this. And if you're a nutritionist, you, this is your life, man. And someone will go, um, and they'll take the menu and go, is this a good food? Well, you know, unless it's something poisonous with with spikes on it, it's probably okay. Uh, is this a good workout? If you could only do one exercise, uh, what's the best? So those questions are what I call either or questions. And folks, there's rare times in life that either or, in my view, is a good option. I, I don't like to be narrowed into either or. So in this uh, workshop, in this presentation, I go through the basics of how I try to take questions in the fitness and nutrition world and recovery world uh, and tie them into certain ways of thinking. Um, there's basically two ways I do it. The first is if then, and you'll find that in a book like Can You Go uh, or, or Now What? Uh, if the client has this issue, then you do this. From there, if, then, if, then, uh, they're algorithms. And it's a great way to put things together, especially when you're training the normal, everybody uh, kind of client, you know, the, the person down the street, your cousin, uh, whatever. The second way I try to look at things is with quadrants, where I try to expand that either or concept out into both and. So you have something very simple, very workable as a coach that you can build on from there. I hope you enjoy the presentation. As always, you can find this video and every other video on my YouTube channel. It's not terribly long, but I think it includes the most important insights from my coaching career. Thank you so much, and let's answer some questions. Okay, this week we have a lot of questions, and some of them are really good. So we have a follow-up from uh, Radic. Now, here's the thing, folks, and I've said this before. Uh, the key to good coaching is the feedback loop. And so I really have to th reach out and thank him for getting back to us so quickly. Um, and he says very simply, this was about press strength and shift work. I was asked to email you back with details about my job on shifts. As I wrote in a previous email, I am working a full-time job as a paramedic. First off, I got to thank you for what you do and everyone you work with. Um, you're uh, an underrated uh, occupation. You guys, you guys literally save lives and you don't get enough thank you. So thank you. My brother-in-law, Craig, is a paramedic and, uh, you know, uh, it's a rare day he doesn't make a difference in this world. So thank you. Uh, plus partial time job as a nurse at an emergency at the ICU in the hospital. Folks, if you are a believer, keep this young man in your prayers. Both jobs are on 12-hour shifts with no particular rhythm or system in changing days and night shifts. And this is exactly what my brother-in-law Craig has to deal with. For example, two day shifts followed by one night shift, one day off, then one day shift followed by two night shifts, two days off, then one day shift followed by three nights, etc. When I arrive back home, I feel like squeezed lemon, no energy left. So I used to train after sleep, but after that sleep, I didn't have power to train in tents. So now I only train heavy on the off days after day shifts and before night shifts. I have decided to start doing the 10,000 swing challenge. I'm not going to recommend that for you, uh, everybody else, but well, okay, let me, 
I'm about to disagree with myself, so let me finish reading. Uh, challenge, just to clear my head from all the thoughts about pressing. And after that period, try to implement your advice to start pressing more again. Well, first off, again, thank you uh, for, for feedback and thank you for sharing this. Boy, this is a, this is a puzzle. This is a, this is a jigsaw puzzle program here. I was about to say you shouldn't do the 10,000 swing uh, challenge, but as the second the, the word came out of my mouth, like a, like a balloon, I said, hold on, that might not be a bad thing for him to do at all, except instead of doing it in 20 days, I'd like to think of you do it in 40 workouts, maybe 250 swings per workout. Um, that way, you'll be able to recover from that very quickly. Uh, the workouts shrink way down between, well, uh, people say 15 minutes, but really more like 20 to 25 minutes. But I'd strongly suggest that you, you try the original idea of the program. So uh, do 15 swings. In, in your case, you want to cr increase your press. 15 swings, uh, three presses. If you're doing single, three left, three right. 15 swings, two presses, two, two. 15 swings, one press, one, one. If you can do more because the bell's lighter and you can slide up to 25, boy, that'll get through the workout quickly. Um, but go three, two, one, three, two, one, or two, one, two, one, depending on uh, uh, the reps you're going to do. And just keep, uh, use very, very natural. Like you said, since you have no rhythm in your schedule, Try to have a bit of a rhythm in your swings and presses. I'm going to do some swings. I did my swings. Press. Make sure you have your, your breath back. Swing, press. Swing, press. And keep your brain uh, as calm as you can the whole time. Keep your breathing as rhythmic as you can. Uh, if you have a heart rate monitor, that'd be kind of a fun thing to look at. But don't, don't go crazy with it. Uh, I would suggest uh, doing a workout, in your case, this is very specific to him, uh, a gentle listener. So you would do uh, a press day. If you can do a goblet squat day the next day, great. Uh, another press day. And then the fourth day be another exercise. So two press days, goblet squat, and either something like a pull-up or a row or, or maybe even nothing on day four uh, and just get the swings done. And just... And just let the, the volume of swings and presses support each other. And uh, ideally, you're taking, I'm hoping you're taking care of the basics of recovery. I know it's tough to sleep. Uh, I worked the night shift uh, for over a year uh, when I was getting my master's degree. <laughs> that was, now that's a story for another time, ladies and gentlemen. That's, that was a tough year. Uh, 10 o'clock to 6.30 in the morning and trying to sleep uh, with any other a, a non-traditional shift is so difficult and I'm, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, but, uh, get your recovery in. I would suggest, um, buying some Epsom salts and doing Epsom salt hot baths uh, as appropriate. Uh, uh, the hot shower, cold shower. Now the research on this stuff is, 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 but here's the funny thing. You're going to feel better whether it's meant <laughs> If you feel better, you feel better. And that's all that counts, okay? Um, finally, if you find yourself struggling at all uh, with, with any of my ideas, uh, email me back. I'm coming out with an article on the 10,000 Swing Challenge and update. If you're on the site, you already have them. But I would even suggest maybe, maybe down the way that we come up with a, another option for you where you would mix swings, Push, swings, pull, swing, squat, swing like suitcase carry, left hand, swing, suitcase carry, right hand. Uh, we, but, let's, but let's just try this original idea first, and then we'll get back to you. Taylor asks, what is a good program or routine to use to transition out of Mass Made Simple? Uh, Mass Made Simple is a program available at On Target Publications. Um, it's a six-week a mass building program. Uh, it's 14 workouts and it's very difficult. There's a lot of squats, there's a lot of eating, and there's a lot of success if you actually do it. Uh, going into the program, I recommend one of two things. Either consciously lean out, which I think is always a good idea before going into a mass program. You get this little rebound out of it. 
or you uh, just can follow the six week squat mastery program that's in the book. Uh, just spitballing here, um, I had this idea that, you know, probably doing both wouldn't be a terrible idea. Do the six week uh, uh, squat program uh, and consciously, you know, cut back on your calories somehow or, or, or do something that'll lean you up a little bit. Transitioning out of the program, I tell you in the book to take it easy. But that's not very specific, right, Taylor? Um, most of the time, what we've done after Mass Made Simple is we've uh, slid over to Jim Wendler's 531 program. Um, and you wouldn't want to do bigger but boring right now just because you want to give yourself a bit of a physical and really a mental break. But uh, Jim's program has, of course, uh, overhead press, bench press, squat, and deadlift. Uh, the variation we used was we would do, well, basically the same thing, but with chains. Um, the one thing we did swap out, we did front squats instead of back squats. That would be the only huge change for us. But what's nice about Wendler's program is you can do it four days a week and do it two days a week. I'm, I'm sure you could do it some other options too. He's got countless variations in his book. But the reason I, I like that so much is after all that squatting that you do in Mass Made Simple and all that bench pressing that you do in Mass Made Simple, when you add the deadlift and the press, it's it's kind of invigorating. Um, we would do it when we did it two days a week, which which I always found with 531 was the best. Uh, we would do pre overhead press and deadlift one day, bench press squat the other day. So as you come off of it, and it's okay actually to take a few days off if you, if you feel the need to, but when you come back, you'll do the military press deadlift day and you haven't done that in six or seven weeks. And so that's actually kind of oddly refreshing. Um, uh, one thing you might have to do is look into his programs that do a little bit more conditioning. One of the downsides of Mass Made Simple, and it's, it's, it's built to make American football players bigger. That's that's what the program came up with, but people liked it because you look a lot of guys look so much better. So it became more of a bodybuilding program, and you know how things morph back and forth. Um, but you know, after all that mass building, you 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 do feel a little bit like, you know, I got to get in shape, and that's because you've added, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds in some cases of mass in that short amount of time. And you don't, you don't feel as connected as you used to, as, 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 as knitted as you used to. So doing hill sprints or doing some kind of conditioning would be a good idea. So here, I'm gonna give you a program, two days a week, uh, five, three, one, with an additional, you know, kind of higher end, um, what uh, Marty Gallagher calls that third wave uh, cardio, uh, rucking, hill running, something that's uh, stadium steps, something along those lines. Don't go crazy. Get, transition like that for about a month and then uh, then sit back and say, okay, you know, as I always tell athletes, now what? Good question, Taylor. Um, in the, If maybe in the future I will uh, jot this out into a little bit more formalized program. But honestly, Taylor, um, most people don't ask this question. Uh, once they finish, they they in that six weeks, they know exactly what they want to do next because you've had six weeks to mull through it. But thank you, Chris writes us, and it, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question and statement. In episode thirty one, I asked about the complementary benefits of the push up to the HKC three goblet squat swing Turkish get up, and you emphasized that they are that they are a legit push. I noticed this difference right away. Uh, I have experimented with adding either a single one, two, three ladder, both sides of kettlebell clean and press, or a single set of as many push-ups at the end of my usual training. I really enjoyed the clean and press. It feels tonic to my shoulders in a way that the get up alone doesn't, and it gets the synovial fluid moving in a manner similar to the goblet squat. Uh, boy, I, I'm, I'm stopping here in the middle, but I hear you, Chris. Uh, when I was getting ready for the RKC back in 2007 or 6 or 8, whatever it was, I would do the rite of passage, and there's that one workout we do. Clean and press. Uh, it ends up being 75 reps left hand, uh, 75 reps right hand, plus 75 pull-ups. The thing I noticed the most is that 
I mean, I felt good from basically my quads to my neck, my knees to my neck felt good. Like I had been, like you said, the synovial feel it. I felt the lymphatic system. Like I, I felt like I was being pumped with goodness. I, I, so I agree with you hundred percent back to Chris. I thought that my get up strength would carry over to the push up, but boy, was I wrong. At, yeah. People who say that the Turkish get up increases your press. I respect a lot of the people who say that and I listen to them and I look at it, but I haven't experienced that as a coach or myself. So I agree with you there. The push-up felt less like an upper body push and more like groundwork and abdominal work uh, uh, like the inchworm. After the swings and get-ups, it took all my effort to keep it pretty. Uh, that's a good point. You know, if I can just add one thing, Chris, I don't know if you know my uh, my work on this, but... Uh, Dan Martin named it, but it's called the Humane Burpee. And I I got I think it's my one-stop shop. Uh, in fact, if you type in Dan John Humane Burpee, I'm sure you'll get, you know, all the options I use. If you go to danjohn.net and you type in Coyote Point Kettlebell Club, you'll get all kinds of swing push-up variations. Um, but the, the Humane Burpee, the original is 15 swings, 10 goblet squats, 10 push-ups. 15 swings, 9 goblet squats, 9 push-ups. 15 swings, 8-8, eight, eight, 15 seven, 7 and then all the way down, 1-1. One, one. You end up with 150 swings, 55 goblet squats, and 55 push-ups. You get Once you get past 7, it's not so bad. But I'll be honest, 7 is a tough round. Because the reps are still pretty high. Once you get five, four, three, two, one, it's really, it, it's still hard. But it's like the big numbers are behind you. I've had people tell me they're going to do this thing where they're going to do 20, 19, 18. It's like, you know, just just do the original first. Um, you can knock that workout down pretty quickly over time. I, I don't want to give you a number because I don't want you racing through it. But you'll be surprised that if you just... I mean, and, and don't go crazy, but if you have a stopwatch or a timer or something like that, time it the first time. And then, you know, when you do it again, maybe a week from there or a few days from now, uh, time it again. And you will notice that you you, you get done quite a bit faster. Uh, I do feel it's okay to stop and rest during it at, when you first do it. But if you can go straight through, I think that's quite, uh, uh, that's quite impressive. So Chris, thank you for the feedback and, uh, Let's keep this discussion going. Thank you. We have an email from Noah. Uh, I hope there's a large arc in this question. <laughs> I hurt a disc in my back doing deadlifts. Well, I'm, I'm worried already about what I'm going to have to answer here, but let's go. Since going to the doctor and, and, and PT and doing all the prescribed exercises, I've attempted to learn to hinge properly. But when I started with swings, a bruise resurfaced on my low back. So I knew that I was doing something wrong. Yeah, if a bruise shows up from a muscle injury, uh, that's that's big. I've, I've When I pull a muscle, like I pulled a spinal rector in junior college, uh, it's interesting, all, all the injuries tend to uh, be right around the same region when I get hurt. Um, it would pull up with this black and blue mark on my lower, lower back. And then uh, my senior year at Utah State, I pulled a hamstring. And again, right there, but from uh, my knees to my socks, just as black, black and blue and green and yellow. Yeah, so I, I know that's, that's a sign that things are going wrong. I'm getting all excited about easy strength, but I cannot decide what to do about the hinge movement. Not to do it at all. You know, that's, that's an option, man. Uh, but we'll move on. Replace it with a hinge movement, which is meant to be easier for those with prior back injuries. <laughs> then he says, grow a pair and learn, learn the met metabolic swing the right way. I'm letting a single exercise, an important one, but still just one, ruin my whole mindset about lifting weights. I'm sick of my attitude and I'm sick of not feeling I have a good way to exercise my lower body. What do you recommend? Well, Noah, uh, the e easy strength program isn't meant to cause this kind of stress in fact it's kind of, it's supposed to relieve the mental stress out of you well first off i you know 
if your back hurts doing deadlifts from the floor, stop doing them. Um, can you trap bar deadlift? Can you put the weights up on a rack or on, like we have at my gym, those little, those little boxes? Um, can you do something like that? Um, I think most people should do deadlifts from either one inch below the knee or one inch above the knee. Um, you don't have to do a hinge to do easy strength. Uh, it it kind of goes against everything I've ever said and written, but it's still all right. I mean, if you did military overhead press, uh, vertical uh, a pull up, uh, something, a chin up, whatever, and then your third exercise was like the front squat versus the um, the deadlift, I think you're going to get a lot of work done. The problem with the front squat, the problem with squatting in easy strength uh, historically has been it's so hard to, uh, it, it's, it is a complex movement. And so you, you, you will find that your load has to be much lower than you would think at first. And uh, according to the forum discussions I've been involved in, people have made it work. They find that 50 to 65% of the load of your best, which is, you know, that's fairly light, is the, is the place to stick with. So press, pull up front squat and then you maybe do something as simple as a curl uh yeah curl and i'm <laughs> i mean that a, a, a curl um when percy Cerruti first uh, you know kind of invented this program he would have his athletes do a bit of a cheat curl um i don't know how much you should cheat on that with your lower back injuries but the curl would be uh, a great supplement for this and just farmer walks and vary that every single workout um, I'd like you to try that. In fact, if you can, now, if you don't know how to front squat and, uh, and you decided to move to the back squat, that's going to get you back into that, your, your back's lever arm is going to get you over that deadlift world. But if you, if you do it the traditional way, the, the, the placement on the, the bar kind of high, and you try to be more of an Olympic lifter, that might get around the problem. Um, but so let's review what I said. Find deadlift variations that don't hurt you. Swap swap out the deadlift in easy strength for something like the front squat and, and add the curl. And let's just see how that goes. Uh, I would like uh, some feedback on this, Noah. Thank you. We have a question from Bjorn. Uh, as we know, Bjorn means bear. Uh, it's a joke I use whenever I'm in Sweden or Norway. I have a question about mass made simple. As the program specifies weights for the squats, depending on body weight, and simultaneously tends to bump the trainee's body weight quite insistently upwards, what happens when one changes weight class in the middle of the program? Should I use the heavier weight for my squats once I pass the 185-pound mark? You know, honestly, again, I thought I addressed this in the book, but I strongly suggest, Bjorn, that you do not ramp your weights up because what we're chasing is we're chasing those high reps in the program. And if you jump from the 185 to the 205 or, or, or heavier, um, you're not going to be uh, accommodating. Uh, it, it's not, uh, frankly, it's probably not going to work. So stick with it. The day you start, that's where you want to be. This is when that other question comes up. How often should you do Mass Made Simple? And that's why most people find the first time they do Mass Made Simple that they get this this big increase in body weight, okay? The second time is when the squat makes more sense. The second time, when I say up to 50, um, they'll, some people have email, uh, emailed me and said, well, basically every workout becomes almost 50 reps after that because I knew how to get to 50. Oh, okay. So first time through, you're going to make the big mass gains. Second time through, you're going to probably find increase strength gains with some mass gains. So, but to answer the question, stick the number you started with. Or as we say in American football, dance with the girl who brung you. Okay. Julian asks a question. My question concerns timed isometric exercises. Well, that's going to be uh, an interesting question. So let's begin. My goal is to become a professional firefighter here in France. And as you imagine, there is a fitness test to pass. I have to get the best results possible because there's a lot of candidates for the job and not so many offers. 
Part of the fitness test is a timed plank, not in the push-up position, but on forearms. I got you. A timed wall sit. Oh, boy, that can be a painful. That can be a painful one. So my, my hat goes out. My heart goes out to you. Uh, thighs parallel to the ground and back against the wall. I know it well. And a timed chin-up hold. Flexed arms, bar at the clavicle, and chin over the bar. Each position has to be held with perfect form or you get disqualified if technique breaks down too much. The timer stops at four minutes for both the plank and the wall sit and one minute and 15 seconds for the chin up hold. That's impressive. The three exercises are done back to back with maybe five minutes of rest in between each of them. How should I train to get comfortable during these particular exercises and not struggle near the end of the required time. Well, welcome to progressive resistance training. Uh, this is what we do. Um, I would think with the plank, the standard plank, uh, you'll probably find the bulk of people taking the test able to get through that four minutes. Uh, one thing I would do first is we, we've got to get a base time and what we're going to do is once you get your, I want you to try each exercise and hold it uh, and be kind of, you know, and, and listen, those numbers are going to go up within a week. But what we want to do is practice the positions. It's going to be a little different than uh, traditional strength training with, with weights and plates and, and load. But what we want to do is get a first a base time. If, if you're at a minute, if you're at a minute here, or let's just, whatever, you're, you're at a minute for this, one of those three exercises. What I'd like you to do is this. Okay, you test, take a day where you test. Come back a day or so later, and what I want you to do is take half, half, whatever it took. So if it, you, you tested for a minute, I want you to do a couple bouts of 30 seconds in each one. With the chin up hold, you might find the first time you only hold it for 10 seconds, okay? Uh, that's a, It's a tough exercise. So when you come back two days later, the next day, I want you to do several bouts at five seconds and get comfortable. Don't blow your engine apart. Get comfortable in that position. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,000. Let go. And just practice that. And over the time, I just want you to spend more and more time at those lighter loads. So day one test, probably have three sessions of you know, I would say three to five rounds of half intensity. Then on the fifth session, retest. Let's just see if you made any adaptions and accommodations at all. Any. After that, maybe you maybe you hold for 15 seconds, which isn't which isn't at all out of believability. And then when I want you to start, what I want you to do is slowly build up. You know, I don't think you should do more than three to five rounds of this, of this, in, in a very often a training session. In fact, that's probably all you should ever do. Three days a week. So yeah, it's gonna be a very. It's up to you because I don't know your schedule, but three to five times a week, I want you to do three to five sessions of this sub maximal holds. And what you're doing is practicing the sub maximal hold. Now the problem is is on this one, uh, the plank on the ground, that's the one that's gonna go fastest improvement because that is probably the easiest of the three. On the wall sit, you're gonna get a good workout on the wall sit and you could probably throw that into your day here and there, uh, just scatter that one throughout the day. That one will progress uh, a little, probably a little bit behind the plank, uh, the floor plank. And the one that's gonna be the problem one is gonna be the chin hold. So that's the one I'd like you to really mentally focus on getting that up to a minute 15. What I'd like you to think about, if you don't mind, Julian, is I'd like you to do build yourself up to a five minute plank, maybe a six minute floor plank, a five or six minute wall sit. Uh, we did that uh, at uh, Judge Memorial back in the day. That was a one of the tests that they had to do to pass my summer weightlifting class was a five-minute wall sit. That was one of the tests. I look back now and I realize it was harder than I thought. Um, and then on the chin-up hold, I'd like you to build up to like a minute 30 or more. So what we want to do is come into the test here so that when you take the actual test, you've got a whole bunch 
of reserve that allow you to pass these tests. And I would like you to get back to me on how this is going. Real simple, initial test, three to five bouts, three to five days of three to five bouts of practice at you know sub-maximal attempts, practicing. And we, what we wanna do is build up over time um, a reserve so that you easily pass these tests. Remember, whenever you're trying out as a candidate for something, you don't just want to survive. You want to be the guy who thrives on the test. I don't know how many of your friends are going to read this, but I'll tell you one other thing. When you finish each one of the things, don't groan. When they say time's over, stay in the plank a little longer. Look around. Look around. Like a, an athlete, get back up. Don't scream. Don't make noise. Nod your head and move on to the next one, okay? That's going to help as much as doing the test itself. Thank you. This is an excellent question, Joan. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this comes to the conclusion of podcast number 36. Remember, if you have questions, email us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and we'll do our best to answer each and every question. Thank you so much.